Hello and welcome to the final segment of the Data Publication 2 workshop. We are talking about creating R packages and in the previous segment we ran through a basic example of setting up a package in a quick and dirty fashion. Um, this section will talk about additional issues to consider. Uh, it is not a code walkthrough, it's more a talk through. Um, this is part of the Data Topic series of workshops. I'm Ryan Womack. I am Data Librarian at Rutgers University Libraries. I'm based in Alexander Library in New Brunswick. And uh, the links, as in all of these, are down below in the description. Uh, I'm going to click through the guide to Data Publication 2, and I'm going to use the, data, the presentation website link um, to work from here and I'm going to choose the R Packages dark uh, theme uh, to work from and we were already down to section 3 of this. So I, I want to highlight uh, other things you want to think about when creating packages. Um, th again, this is all from the R Packages book by um, Hadley Wickham and Jennifer Bryan. That's fantastic reference uh, and it ha it's freely available on the web and has all the details. I'm just kind of giving you a, a gateway intro into that book in a sense. Uh, and we're going to culminate with really talking about distributing data via packages, which we didn't illustrate in the code, um, but we're going to talk about it here. All right. So, gotchas, right? So, as I mentioned in the previous segment, 10% uh, of the time there are differences between regular R coding and package coding. So, we don't use a library command. We have to use an import in the description. So, we have to specify um, that importing. Um, so we we have to um, also refer to the commands in their long form, right? So even though we've loaded dplyr to, uh, via an imports command, we should not ever just say mutate one of the dplyr commands. Uh, we should say dplyr colon colon mutate so that in every circumstance on every other user's machine um, it will know to use the dplyr mutate and you're not going to get into any issues. Um, the, in the description file there's a section that says imports. It does not actually import the package. Right, This is a distinction to make. Uh, it just makes sure that those packages are installed. Um, if they're not installed when you try to install your own package, it'll give you a warning saying, oh, you need this package. Um, but following you know, these conventions is going to um, take care of those kinds of problems. In addition, every package mentioned in the namespace must have an imports or depends uh, mention elsewhere. That's described a little bit more in detail in the book. Um, I'm just warning you to kind of watch out for that. Another little tip, which I skipped over, um, is this available package. So when we talked about creating a package name that fits in with um, the CRAN ecosystem, um, and I'm still having an issue um, connecting directly to the RStudio site. We should be able to go to the mirror site, which is rstudio.com. So if you're thinking of a title, you can run it through this available, the package name is available, available package. Uh, we'll check, does anyone else use that name? Uh, is it used in any of the major spaces? 
and could it have a problematic meaning in some languages, right? So this is actually really uh, quite useful to run as a quick thing. Um, so I'd recommend that. Uh, and let me just go back. All right. So another another thing to think about code style, right? So if your ultimate goal is to have that package out there for the for the world, um, you're going to want to meet the expectations of um, that community. So there's a tidyverse style guide that will help you with that. There is a styler package that will help check and enforce the tidyverse style on your code. Um, and when you're writing a package, like these are just some some tips, right? That, as I mentioned, the library command doesn't work quite the same way. Um, so these should not be in your code. Uh, you should instead use the description to specify the requirements and use that long form of command reference. Um, also, don't use source. Use load all instead. So, you know, a couple of these practices that might be habits from your regular R programming, uh, you'll have to do something different when you're writing package code. Um, there's a list of other functions that should be, you should watch out for. Um, there's a useful package called with R that, um, like if you do something, you know, you do something and then after it's done, it restores the state to before you you did that thing. Um, this is also part of kind of careful package coding. I know that may sound a little vague, all these things, but these are, um, when you're actually coding, they are things that, that can make a difference. All right, we talked about testing um, in our example. I think I think that these reminders are things that we don't need to go uh, into further detail about, um, except there is a package called Mockery. Um, I just found this interesting because it was not a concept that I had thought about too much. Um, mockery is when you would like to um, simulate the results of a function. Right. You might have a function that in real life uh, makes a call to a, like a web service. But w when you run it in a testing environment, you don't want to call a web service, right? The internet might be down, um, the service might be down, as is our project right now, for whatever reason. Um, right. You don't want this to happen when your testing goes through and then have your package rejected because it failed the test. So mockery lets you, the whole concept, I mean, this is one package that does it, but the um, mockery uh, lets you kind of simulate the results of certain functions or certain behaviors uh, and insert those results into the, the testing process. Um, so a little something extra to think about during your your testing um, we again have this tests directory but the um, tests for any function the functions go in the R directory but the tests for the function uh, go into test that under the tests directory and it's often useful to label them as like test hyphen um, so that it's clear what they are. Um, okay, next section on documentation. We talked a little bit in the previous section about even though it seems like you're learning a funky new tool when you learn R Oxygen 2, um, 
it's actually easier than learning the specialized markdown markup language that only applies to our documentation. Um, you're going to have to learn one or the other. This one is more versatile, actually, and um, lets you get more done with less. So uh, our oxygen is um, is recommended. Uh, so we we we've followed the the steps of the workflow. Um, beyond the documentation that we looked at in our sample code, there's more detailed documentation, right? So there's vignettes, uh, which are discussed in the R Packages book. Vin a vignette is, rather than the dry functional reference, that's usually the reference manual in R, is just all of the functions listed together um, and all of their standard documentation. A vignette is an actual composed document that explains, you know, how do we use the functions in this package? How might we conduct an analysis using these functions? Um, and it lets you as a package creator kind of highlight, you know, what this is all about. So vignettes are great. Um, they're much more like writing a PDF, but, you know, there's a, there is a, a little bit of... Um, detail to make sure that the R package recognizes them as a vignette. Um, also highly recommended if you're going into, um, you know, go going to be using this for a package that is going to have a wider use is the package down package. The package down package lets you take the stuff that you've already done to write documentation for the package and build a website out of it. It really just like almost a quick step like build site. Uh, and you'll get something that looks like this. It looks like the tidyverse site. It looks like, you know, a lot of standard R sites. Um, and the functional references, you know, kind of sort of are built themselves based on the documentation. But, you know, you have a much you know, you have this pretty format that's easy to use, easy to search. Uh, so really highly recommended if you're going to make something publicly available to take advantage of the package down package. Um, for general public consumption in like a GitHub re repository, a README and a news file uh, are very, really useful. The news file kind of saying, oh, the latest release updated this. Um, we've now added this functionality uh, to highlight that. You can even produce a hex sticker. And I don't know what's going on with the R project site. Um, but there's even a package to produce the Tidyverse style hex stickers um, for your own package, right? So if you want to have these kind of cute little stickers, you can do that too. Uh, licensing is another topic. We referred to GPL MIT um, for data. Uh, data is um, its sort of own area. So, so some people will often recommend that you use a CC0 license. CC0 means no copyright. I do not claim copyright on this material. Uh, it means that anyone can take it and use it without, without thinking twice. And it's recommended in a lot of data contexts because a lot of data, like if you're looking at something like climate data, right? A person who's building a climate model wants to scoop up data from as many representative sources as they can, they might be scooping up 200 or more different data sources and they don't want to think about, I'm, I'm using this data with this license and another data with a different license. And even to start thinking about licensing in that context is it discouraging people to use your data. 
So if your goal is to make get the data used as much as possible, CC0 is recommended. You may want to require attribution, um, and so you can use a CC BY license, which is very open, except that you do require um, if somebody uh, incorporates incorporates your data that they'll they will give you some credit somewhere where they're publishing about that. Uh, you can also choose a proprietary license uh, using use proprietary license. However, that's not going to be on CRAN. CRAN is all about open source software, so um, it's not going to meet their requirements. Um, there's a, a text that will help you work your way through this um, called Licensing R, and there's a website that will help you choose a license. So you have some resources for that. Okay, and finally, we're going to talk about um, one of the things that motivated us to talk about our packages in the first place is making data available, right? So if you if your community consists of a lot of R users and um, you want to make data available to them, uh, you might simply want to bundle it in a package, right? The package lets people easily import it into R. It lets them it ensures that the documentation of the data travels alongside the data. Um, you know, it's a very useful way of, you know, bundling that. So data, we simply put them in the data folder. And in general, what I'm going to recommend is that you do two things. You have a raw form of the data, for example, CSV comma separated value text file um, that's you know sort of a universally accessible version of the data. This would be um, placed in a data in a data directory under inst slash ext data and the inst is only visible inside when you're creating the package. Once you build the package it appears as an X data directory or, you know, external data. Um, you don't necessarily exactly have to name it this, but um, the uh, this directory will be visible to people so that they can grab the, you know, plain text version of the data or whatever standardized format you want to make it available in. But for ease of loading and ease of use in R, you also want to have a native R object. So that would be an RDA file. And you can simply put that in the data directory of your package, right? So in the, the data directory, uh, you put an RDA file for every object you want to use. So if you have, you know, climate, world climate data, you save it in R as an R object, it'll save it as an RDA file, and you put that worldclimatedata.rda file in data, and you might want to put a worldclimatedata.csv file in this external data directory to have both those versions available to people. When you're writing code that will use the data, like you might have examples of Here's some functions, you, you know, some analysis you might want to run on the data. You use uh, this format of a command. Use this, colon, colon, use data. Um, another thing you can do with R, right, is if you have cleaned your data, you can show how you cleaned the data. This is, you know, an excellent idea for reproducibility. You can have a data raw directory and then a the code that you used to clean the data also available and you know in that way you're distributing just in the one package a complete view of like how you how you shaped your data and people can really understand what you're what you're doing um, the problem with distributing directly to R I mean to CRAN is that data sets need to be small less than a megabyte 
and you can argue for an exemption like if you have a large data set uh, that you just want to you have a, a use for demonstrating large data um, and you make an argument to them that you're not really going to be updating it all that often um, so they the burden of them storing it it will not be that great um, you can sometimes convince Cran to take things that are bigger than a megabyte but there will be a step involved um, also when you compress your data you have a better chance of fitting under that that limit uh, finally uh, the two are oxygen tags that we didn't talk about before that apply to data are at format so we can just you can here describe you know this is a data set of 200 observations of 10 variables uh, here are the variables defined um, you know that is a place you can give that data overview and at source is like a a link to where the data originally came from so you know also you might have a larger data set that doesn't fit these limits that could be the ultimate source of data that you're sampling in an R package um, and you don't use this at export the at export is to make sure that like functions and things get exported into the workspace um, but you don't want to do that for a data set so there shouldn't be an at export statement uh, in the R oxygen preface to a data set um, there's more in the book there's always more in the book uh, please check the R packages book it's got a lot of really great things a whole chapter on data um, that goes into much more detail uh, so I hope this has whet your appetite for some of that um, and is useful for you in getting started um, this is the end of the data publication 2 content and uh, again thank you for your attention and hope to see you back for future workshops in the data topics series have a great rest of your day evening or wherever time period you're in.